Greetings and welcome. Let's begin with a word of prayer and then we will get into our lesson for the morning. Our Holy Father, God, we love you, we trust you, and we hope in you. We pray that you are with us. We pray that we uh, are comforted and given peace by you, Father. We thank you for all the many ways that you have shown your love for us. And we pray that we never forget those and that we uh, relish in them and that we live lives of gratitude, appreciation, and thanksgiving because of who you are and all that you have done. We thank you for the church at Jackson Street. We pray for unity and growth. We pray for peace. We pray that we're able to shine as a light in the world around us. Father, we pray that we love one another. We pray that we live lives that are consistent with a love of one another and a love of you, and that we live now in light of the glory to come. We thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you for the hope we have through him. We pray that we're able to meet together again quickly. We pray for wisdom and patience among our leadership and among all of those who worship together at Jackson Street. And Father, we pray that this virus will go away quickly. We pray that people will be able to uh, resume their businesses, that people will be able to resume their lives, and that not only will we meet together again, but we'll have learned valuable and important lessons about the value of community and about the need and dependence that we have for one another. We love you. We thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. If you're looking for a song that will go well with the lesson this morning, uh, one I would suggest is number 579 in our songbooks. It is My Jesus, I Love Thee. It's one of my favorite songs. Uh, the first verse of it says, My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. There is not much... Uh, fact, I'll just go ahead and say there is nothing uh, more important in this whole wide world than the love that we have for God and for his son, Jesus. If you were to go through all of the law and look for the most important and the greatest commands, you know what you would find number one on top of that list? It's called the Shema. It's Deuteronomy chapter six and verse four. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. Uh, that passage right there, when Jesus is asked, what's the most important thing you can do? He quotes that passage. But what's interesting is he also quotes another one. He quotes Leviticus chapter 19, which says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He says, if you get those two passages, then you'll get everything else. That's a really, really important idea. And it's actually the idea that we're going to be discussing uh, here this morning. In Romans chapter 12, if you want to open your Bibles there, our lesson's going to come from Romans 13, the second half of Romans 13. But in Romans chapter 12, there's a, a massive shift that takes place in the book of Romans. Uh, beginning of verse, the first two verses, it says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service, or your uh, spiritual service of worship is what the New American Standard says. Um... And do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. A couple of things that I think are really, really interesting about that passage. Um, when you think of sacrifice and you think of like the Old Testament and the animal sacrifices and stuff like that, uh, it's probably been a while since you've taken a bull or a goat and slaughtered it and offered it up on an altar. Uh, why is that? Well, on the one hand, uh, we don't do sacrifices anymore. We, as Christians, don't do not do animal sacrifice. So we have a perfect sacrifice, which is Christ. Uh, but at the same time, Paul doesn't say, don't think about sacrifice anymore. That's not important. Instead, what he says is, you embody that sacrifice. You become a living sacrifice to God. And that is how you serve him. That's what your spiritual reasonable service to God is, is that you live for him day in and day out, giving him your all. You don't become a sacrifice unless you're pretty fully committed to it. You know, uh, you don't sacrifice 10% of an animal. Uh, it's a full thing. It's a complete thing. And Paul is calling us to give our complete allegiance to what we're doing with Christ. And if you're going to do that, it's going to change the entire way that you view the world. Verse 2, so don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed 
by the renewing of your mind. And so what we're going to talk about in the lesson has a lot to do with what that transformation looks like, what that full commitment and transformation of mind really looks like. Because I think that's actually largely what the book of Romans is trying to describe. That's what it's trying to get us to, to grasp and to fully understand. The major shift that takes place in Romans is like the first 11 chapters or so are discussing the theology of that transformation of mind. And chapters 12 through 16 are discussing what that actually looks like played out in real life context, what it looks like in the real life body of the church. And what I believe the transformation of mind is really talking about Rather than being conformed to the world, we're supposed to view things differently. What things? I think Romans, first and foremost, uh, is each other. We're supposed to view each other in light of the lives we now live in Christ. The world would tell Jew and Gentile that you're too different. You can't worship together. Jews uh, have all this uh, history. They have their own scriptures. They have their own views. Gentiles uh, have their own history, their own way of viewing the world. And by putting them together, you're it's like cats and dogs. You know, you're, it's going to be a problem. It's going to cause a lot of hardships. And uh, not only does the world tell them that, but they're struggling with that themselves. I think the book of Romans is largely written because Paul is receiving a word about complaints and, and, and disputes in, in the church in Rome. And Paul is planning on using the church in Rome as a launching pad to his mission uh, efforts as he kind of plans to go off to Spain, or at least that's what his goal is. Uh, he'll, he'll get arrested before then. But, uh, but Paul has these plans, and he's going to try to build a relationship with the church in Rome. And one of the things that he's aware of taking place there are disputes between Jew and Gentile. Uh, as for the reasons of the disputes, it is interesting to note that in about 49 or so AD, there was an emperor in Rome, Emperor Claudius. And one of the things that he did is he expelled all the Jews out of Rome. Uh, you can read about this in Acts chapter 18, the first verse. Uh, Paul ends up meeting Aquila and Priscilla because they lived in Rome, but then they got kicked out uh, a, because they were Jews and they got kicked out of Rome. There was this mass banishment of the Jews from Rome. There's a Roman historian named Suetonius, and he describes the same thing also. And he gives us an interesting detail that says that these disputes were because the Jews kept fighting with one another about Christus. Uh, it's It's... A kind of a misspelling uh, of the name Christ, if it's about Christ, which, which most historians think that it is, or a lot of them do. Uh, and so what seems to be happening is you have these Jews, some of them are Christians, some of them aren't, and they're arguing about this Christus or this Christ. And uh, in fact, the arguments got so uh, unsettling and disruptive that all of the Jews, whether they were Christian or not, just got kicked out of Rome. And that was under Emperor Claudius, right? Well, a couple of years later, Claudius is no longer emperor, uh, and the Jews start making their return trips back home. But think about the church in that setting. Think about a church that was primarily Jewish, and then all of a sudden, all the Jews are banished, and now you have a Gentile church. And they're going to do things in Gentile ways, and they're going to care about days that Gentiles care about. They're going to eat foods that Gentiles eat. But now all of a sudden, you have these Jews who are coming back and they're going to want to take the church back to the way that it was. And they're going to want to think about days that Jews care about and think about days that, uh, and, and foods that Jews eat. And, and, and all of a sudden, they get back together and Jew and Gentile are having a hard time uh, worshiping with, working with, and being united with one another. There's a lack of peace there because they're each kind of vying for power in the church. Some of them are haughty and arrogant. Some of them are judging the other ones. And so what Paul does in the book of Romans, and he does this masterfully, is he describes the foundation of Christian unity through proper understanding of the gospel. Paul, I believe, uh, and I think this is true, and we should all believe this, sees the foundation of our unity in Christ is Jesus Christ. And what he has done for us. And the fact that we are all united together through sin. We're all united together through faith in Christ. We're all united together through uh, the righteousness of Christ. And what he has done for us. And, and so you look at the book of Romans. And it's largely this lengthy description. As to how the problem of sin for both Jew and Gentile. 
is solved by Christ and what life in Christ looks like. Romans chapter 9 through 11 is this three chapter in-depth discussion of how both Jew and Gentile together fit into the family of God and together fit into the people of God. And so you read through this and he's been building up to all of these, uh, this like deep and detailed and rich theology about how the gospel unites all peoples of the earth, including Jew and Gentile. And then he gets to chapter 12 and he says, so stop it <laughs> and stop being conformed to the way the world would have you think about one another and be transformed and actually work together and love one another. Uh, the world often tells us who should and should not be together. I don't know if you've noticed that, uh, but the world will, you know, the rich will gather here and the poor will gather there. The 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 males here and the females there. The uh the whites and the blacks and like you do it by nationality, by race, by all of these different things. And what Paul is saying is that in Christ there is no distinction between Jew or Greek, male and female, slave and and, and master. Like all are one in Christ Jesus. And I think Romans is a very detailed description of what that actually looks like. And if you're going to live in that way, you cannot listen to the world anymore. You have to be transformed. So Romans chapter 12 verse through 16 is really telling you how to live in that way and what that's actually going to look like in a real life setting, in a real life situation. And so Romans 12, he moves directly from that sentence into discussing uh, the different uh, roles that people have in the body of Christ and how those ought to be things that complement and build up the body rather than sources of division. And then he gives this beautiful passage that sounds so much like the ethics of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount or in the Sermon on the Plain in Luke chapter 6. Romans chapter 12, I'm going to read verses 9 through 21. And I want you to think about these words that Paul writes and take them very, very seriously in your dealings with one another and in your dealings with the world. But notice uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Uh, I also want you to, to note the uh, words evil and good through this because they are going to be contrasted with one another quite a bit. But the first thing he says is let love be without hypocrisy. Uh, he's going to be discussing what love looks like. This is a description of what, if you are a Christian and you claim to love your neighbor as yourself, here's what it looks like. So this is what pure love actually is. Not hypocritical. It's not clinging to evil. It's not uh, abandoning good. Love is going to look a certain way. This is a description of what love in Christ actually is. Verse 10, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference for one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is good in the sight of all men, if possible. So far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What does love look like in the life of the Christian? It looks a whole lot like that. It looks like you being concerned about suffering with, caring for, providing for, joining together in the needs of the community of Christ, joining together with one another. When persecution comes, you do not respond in kind. You don't respond to evil with evil, but you bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. When people uh, have mistreated you, you never take your own revenge. Even when the world has mistreated you, you leave room for the wrath of God. Revenge does does not have a place in the ethic of Christian love. Uh, vengeance and hatred and uh, paying back evil for evil, that's not how you win. 
The way you win is by overcoming evil with good. Don't be overcome by evil. When evil happens, don't let that lead you to do something evil because then more evil will come and you'll do more evil. And evil has a way of always, always, always producing more evil. The way to stop evil is goodness. That's how you can stop it. Uh, it's the same type of thing. If someone mistreats you and you want to get back at them, you can mistreat them. But now there's two bad deeds that have done. And so then they mistreat you. Now there's three. And then you, you know the way to stop that? They mistreat you and you forgive them. In order for evil to win, it has to be returned. But evil loses when forgiveness and goodness and love shine. And so that's what Paul is saying. That's what the Christian ethic of love is all about. Right? That's how you love without hypocrisy. You abhor what's evil. You cling to what is good. And if good is going to win, you don't be overcome with evil. You overcome evil with good. You never pay back evil for evil, all right? So what does what's going to happen to evil then? I mean, because if you do that, then all of a sudden it's like, well, you're just going to get walked all over and evil's going to win, right? I mean, if every time someone does something bad to you, you do something good to them, then people are just always going to do bad things. At least that's the fear. That's the concern. That's why people look at this and they say, ah, oh, that's just naive. You know, you can't actually live that way. A um, couple of, of problems with that. Uh, one of them is that you if you think that way, are forgetting who's actually truly the ruler and who's in charge. This passage does not say that there will never be vengeance. This passage doesn't say there will never be wrath. It says that that's God's. Leave it to God. God's a whole lot better at vengeance and at wrath than we are. God is a whole lot better at solving these types of problems than we are. And so what we do is we show the example of Jesus who lovingly died for his enemies. And while on the cross said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they are doing. He suffered, he bled, and he died. And he showed the depths of God's love. But at the same time, we wait. At the same time, we trust that Evil will have its day of recompense. Uh, the evil will not win, and it's because God is the one who's actually overseeing all of these things. And a day is coming when the supreme ruler of the whole world will do what is right, and evil will be punished. But before that day happens, God actually has other ways of dealing with evil also. And that's where Romans chapter 13, the first uh, seven verses, come into play. It discusses one of the ways that evil is punished when Christians aren't the ones doing it. It's the government sometimes is the one who God uses to punish evil and to promote good. Um, Romans 13 is a dangerous passage because a lot of times people have used Romans 13 to just accept and support anything any government does. Uh, if Romans 13 is blindly read as divine approval of all governments of all time and of every decision they made, uh, then we're, we're just ignoring a lot of the Bible and we're ignoring uh, the context of Romans 13. But Romans 13 is generally being discussed, uh, this passage about the government, as a, a way that God punishes evil even now. And so you look at Romans 13, one of the reasons you don't have to take your own vengeance is because God takes vengeance. And you don't have to take wrath because God has wrath. And so if you remember Romans 12, 9, just notice three words in this passage. Uh, sorry, Romans 12, 19. Notice three words in it. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. As it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Revenge, wrath, and vengeance. Uh Wrath is something that you leave to God. Revenge is something that you leave to God. Vengeance is something that you leave to God. But notice the words revenge and vengeance kind of sound alike, like they have uh, a similar uh, a similar etymology, like they, they are related to each other. The same is true uh, when you get to chapter 13 and verse 4 that says, talking about the government, it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. It is a minister of God, an avenger, who brings wrath on the ones who practice evil. Uh, and so Romans 12 ends by saying, never you know, practice evil, do good, even when other people are doing evil. Never take your own revenge, never take your own vengeance. Why? Because God has vengeance, 
God takes revenge, and God is the one who has, uh, through the government, is an avenger of those who practice evil. So you don't need to do it. You can trust in God to do it. Uh, and so Romans 13 is kind of contrasting Romans 12. This is the way that Christians live, and this is the way that God solves some of the problems in the world. Uh, and one of those is through the use of government, which is why things like you know, murder, or even, even in wicked governments, murder and theft, there are some things that are generally always going to be illegal. Um, and, and because there is a standard of good that is supposed to be promoted, even among wicked empires, which certainly Rome would have been. Uh, the idea of the, the, the empire or the government being a servant of God has deep Old Testament roots with kings like Cyrus and kings like Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, you have this idea of God using wicked kings to accomplish some of his own good. And he seems to be doing that in Romans 13, even with Rome, which is not to say that God always approves of everything every government does. If you read the book of Revelation, you realize that that's, that's just simply not the case. But having said all of that, it brings us to the passage that we are going to be looking at in Romans chapter 13 in verse eight, or sorry, verse seven uh, is kind of where he ends talking about the government. And he says, Render to all what is due them, or literally what you owe them. Tax to whom taxes due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. But then verse 8 again contrasts that, and I think at verse 8 is where he gets back to his discussion for Christians uh, at the end of chapter 12. Like chapter 13, 1 through 7 could almost be put in parentheses. Like it's this brief, it kind of fits oddly into this discussion. But if you go straight from chapter 12, verse 21 to chapter 13 and verse 8, I think you're, you're seeing the flow of what Paul is saying to us as Christians and how we are supposed to live. And he says in verse 8, owe nothing to anyone. All right. So in verse 7, he says, Render what you owe. And he uses the exact same word twice. One, he's talking about to the government. There are things that you owe, so pay your taxes, do that stuff. But when it comes to our lives as Christians, make sure that you're not living to where you owe people things. Don't take from people where you owe them back and all that. Instead, what you do is owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. You remember what the uh, greatest command is to love the Lord your God? And what's the second like it? to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, he says, make sure that that's what you owe people, that you love one another. For he who loves his neighbor, that's Leviticus 19, has fulfilled the law. So in the same way that in Romans 12, Paul does not say, ah, don't worry about sacrifice. Sacrifice doesn't matter anymore. He says, you make yourself a living sacrifice. In Romans 13 and verse eight, he doesn't say, ah, oh, the law doesn't matter anymore. That's just old stuff. Instead, what he says is fulfill the law. But through Christ, we fulfill the law in new ways. We fulfill the law in, in ways that uh, were unforeseen before. And what he's saying here is the way that you fulfill the law is by loving your neighbor. And he gives some examples of that. Verse 9, uh, for this, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not covet. Those are all part of the Ten Commandments. He says, if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So you think about the Ten Commandments. Think about all the commandments he says. Don't covet. Don't uh, murder, don't steal, don't commit adultery. If you're truly loving your neighbor as yourself, you wouldn't do those things because you don't want someone coveting all of your stuff or stealing from you or killing you or sleeping with your wife or, or taking your things or mistreating you. or Like the laws that God gives in the, in the Hebrew scriptures and in the Torah are designed to show you how to love your neighbor as yourself. The teachings that Jesus gives are designed to show you how to love your neighbor as yourself. And so if you get the love of neighbor right, then all of these other things are fulfilled and are satisfied in that. The way that Paul views the Old Testament, I think is very interesting. He doesn't seem to say that it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, he doesn't say that oh, you don't have to listen to that stuff. In fact, Everything Paul's saying right here, like this whole discussion is rooted in the idea of loving your neighbor as yourself. That's Leviticus. Like Paul clearly thinks we should be following that. He clearly is using the Old Testament to describe Christian ethics. But there are certain parts of the law, certain things like uh, circumcision, certain things like uh, observing certain days and special days and feast days and Sabbaths and things like that, 
that are put in the law, and they were ways of making the children of Israel unique. And what ended up happening is the children of Israel used those as kind of ways of separating them from all of the Gentiles. They were boundary markers to the Gentiles. But if you remember the very promise made to Abraham all the way back in Genesis chapter 12 was that through his seed, all the families of the earth would be blessed. Not just his seed would be blessed, but everyone. So the purpose of the call of Abraham and his family was always to open up the door to all peoples. All right. And so what do you do with those boundary markers and those things when, uh, uncircumcised people want to come in, or people who don't observe those special days, or people who don't eat the, the, the particular Jewish diet. What about those things that separate Jews from all the other people? Once the door is open to all people, what do you do with those types of laws? And that created a lot of conflict in uh, early Christianity. Like Acts 15, they have this big meeting in Jerusalem about it. If you read Romans 14 and 15, uh, Paul is going to say things like, accept one another, Romans chapter 14 and verse 1, Romans chapter 15 and verse 7, therefore accept one another. He's going to, in that section right there, tell them how to accept one another. Accept one another, chapter uh, 14 and verse 2, one person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. And the one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats. Romans 14 and 15, he's actually going to talk about certain days that you observe. He's going to actually talk about certain foods that you eat. Some of these things that would cause problems and division among Jews and Gentiles. And what Paul is saying is, whatever you do, do the very best you can to honor God with it and accept one another for the choices they make. But you know how you fulfill the law? It's not based on what's on your plate. It's not based on what day that you're honoring or observing. You know what it is? It's whether or not you love your neighbor as yourself. That's what's going to matter. That's what will unite you guys. That's what will bring Jew and Gentile together. And so based on that, verse 10 of chapter 13, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And so we started the discussion, chapter 12 and verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy. Uh, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. And he finishes chapter 13 and verse 10, Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. This whole section is on the supremacy of love and what that looks like in the Christian life. And what does it look like? Well, it actually leads to a transformed way of life. It leads to a transformed way of viewing one another and a transformed way of living. There's a day coming. Christ will return, the, the, the world uh, will be judged in righteousness, and we will live forever with the one who saved us. That's a glorious and it's a wonderful day. And it's a day that when you look towards it and you think about it, you know what's true about that day? These things that the world tells us, ah, you should be divided based on wealth or color or this, 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 and this, this, those things won't exist anymore. Separation between Jew and Gentile won't be a part of that day. Uh, adultery and murder and theft and selfishness and con co covetousness and contempt and, and political strife and hatred and all of that stuff isn't going to be a part of that grand and glorious day. And so what Paul's going to end this chapter by doing is saying, as that day approaches, he's going to use a couple of illustrations. He'll use the illustration of like, now we're in darkness, but then will be a day of night or a day of light. Now it's nighttime, but then it'll be morning and daylight will come. Uh, now we are, is, is a time of sleep, but then we will be awake. Like he uses all of these illustrations to describe that day. And he says, since that day is coming, let's live like that now. Let's live like we're in the day now, even though we're in nighttime. Let's live like it's light now, even though we're in darkness. What he's saying is look forward to that future day. And Christians are called to live now in light of the day that is to come. That's where our ethics come from. Uh, our ethics come from the reign and the rule of God. Our ethics come from the will of God being done on earth as it is in heaven. And so Christians are to live now with a view of that glorious and wonderful day, a day where love reigns supreme over all. And so, chapter 13 and verse 11, do this, knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. 
For now, salvation, that's the day that he's talking about, is nearer to us than when we believed. Uh, Paul, salvation is spoken of in a couple of different ways in the Bible. Uh, but in Romans, Paul tends to speak of salvation as a future thing. Like we're, we're waiting for the day of salvation. And what he's saying is it's nearer now than when you first became a Christian. And with each passing moment, the day gets closer and closer and closer and closer. So verse 12, the night where we're now living is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. So let's clothe ourselves in light and be prepared for uh, to live now in darkness as though it were light and we're prepared for light and we're soldiers of the light. These next two verses that we'll close out the chapter with are some of the most profound verses ever written in the Bible. And they've had an impact on the history of Christianity uh, for some profound ways because it's possible that no single author has had more of an impact on Christianity after the Bible was written than uh, Augustine of Hippo or Augustine. And uh, he... He uh, gives credit to his conversion uh, to hearing, he was in Milan, I think, at the house of Ambrose, and he was hearing uh, this voice saying, pick up and read, pick up and read. He wasn't even sure where it was coming from, if maybe it was the kids in the next yard or something. Anyway, he picks up and he starts to read, and this is the verse that he read. And he said it was that that led to his uh, conversion to Christ, and he ended up having, you know, writing a ton and having a huge impact on the history of Christianity. But this is what he called, was called to do, and it was actually rather difficult for him because he had lived a rather riotous life prior to this. But I want you to think about these words. This is what it means to live now as fulfilling the law. This is what it means to live now as loving your neighbor as yourself. This is what it means to live now in light and in view of that glorious day that is to come. Verse 13, let us behave properly as in the day not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. You know, when you are loving just yourself, rather than loving your neighbor as yourself, when you're loving just yourself, then all that matters is what you can do and what and you get in your way. So strife and jealousy... That's a part of loving yourself and living for yourself. Uh, uh, things like drunkenness and carousing and things like sexual promiscuity and sleeping around. Those are things you do when you're concerned about your own lusts, your own desires, your own wants, your own, uh, you know, satisfying every whim that you have and every desire that pops up and every fleeting moment, making it about you. Those are the types of decisions that you make. But when you decide, I'm not going to be conformed to the world. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to transform my way of thinking. I'm going to live as a living sacrifice day in and day out to my God. And I'm going to love my neighbor as I love myself. I'm going to love others. Then I'm not going to see them as objects for my sexual uh, satisfaction. I'm not going to get drunk and have fights. I'm not going to be jealous and, 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 and live in strife. I'm going to live a different kind of life because I'm living for them. I'm living for Christ and I'm living for the day to come. And I think that's what Paul is trying to encourage us to do. So I want to challenge us to think that way now. I want us to, whatever we're doing, wherever we are, in any way that we're living, to honestly stop and reflect, is my life right now a sacrifice to God that he would be pleased with? Is my life right now about my brothers and sisters and about loving my neighbor as myself, fulfilling the law in that way? Is my life now consistent with what I hope eternity will be like? Do I want to live for eternity the way that I'm living right now? Is that what I want heaven to be like or the resurrection to be like? Do I want people in the resurrection to do the types of things that I'm doing? Live now in light of the day that is to come. Live now in such a way that fulfills the law. I love you. May the love of God be with you.